I'm down here in Paddington in Sydney's eastern suburbs to talk to Josh Nyland. He recently won the James Beard Book of the Year Award, the Oscars for the culinary world. We're not only going to talk about how to utilise a whole fish, he's also going to show me how. Josh Nolan, welcome to One Plus One. Thanks, Kurt. Nice to see you. So what are we sitting down to today? Well, kingfish. They're running at the moment and they're phenomenal. You can see it's almost like a boomerang sitting up off the, <laughs> off the board. I'm going to confess, it's my favourite fish. What I wanted to show you is the scaling technique that we do. I mean, this is a bear trap on a stick. I've got one in my camera. <laughs> Dragging this across the surface, even on the fine side, you're impacting the texture of the flesh. So even when you're eating a beautifully sliced raw sashimi of kingfish or ocean trout or tuna, you know, that's experienced some kind of stress due to this. So put that aside. <laughs> and then basically starting at this end, you want to get the blade between the scale and the skin. This is called subiki, and it's a Japanese method. You can have a look. Yeah. <laughs> it is just scale. Yeah. It's all that gradient, kind of finding the angle, so that you can, and kingfish is actually one of the more difficult ones to do, especially around the shoulder of the fish up the spine here. It, it thins out even more, so. Even that definition, the shoulder of the fish. Probably the silly lingo to, to be calling it. I mean, it's, it's probably got a specific name that I should probably I, know. I, but... I, I kind of I get what you mean though. Yeah. You're, you're, you're approaching the shoulder of the fish. Yeah. <laughs> as much as we see it as work, there's so much joy in breaking down an animal. So I just really wanted to try to explore fish in a different way. Tail comes off. Tail's fantastic for stocks. And you can see a little bit of blood coming out. So it's a bit crazy, but we um we made black pudding. <laughs> Not wanting to gross anyone out, but it's like But you might be. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'm sure I am. When you get, say, 30 big kingfish come through the door, we want to be able to maximize its potential. And so if that means harvesting you know, 50 mil of blood from each fish to then generate 10 portions of a black pudding to go on the restaurant menu. Fantastic. And that's a really unique experience for somebody to have down there. Have you seen it done before? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to go in here, which is approximately where we think the tail would be getting cut. And then just a little tap. And then shank comes off. That's our first cut, which is the shank. The next one, which is a chop or a darn, and you can see that beautiful big kind of orb of bone marrow. Which wouldn't make it into any other dish, really. Like, when, when would you? On slightly bigger fish, like on a, you know, your gropers and cods that get to a, a significantly bigger waist, we stand them up on a roasting tray and then we pop them in the oven and we bring them out. You know, all that bone marrow is basically gone to liquid and then tip it onto toast and then some parsley and pickled onions, and it's a really, really delicious snack. And then that one comes out, and that's just a beautiful piece of kingfish fillet. There's our little one of many chops that can be pulled out. Right. So the belly's out. So that one there comes out. That one we have these two. <laughs> I think Mavo Mira used the word visceral. Uh, <laughs> a massive amount of fish where you think traditionally to the bin. Straight to the bin. I still can't believe that you can turn that eyeball <laughs> into into a prawn cracker. A prawn cracker. Have you heard of a part on an animal called an intercostal? I've busted my own intercostal. Oh right. <laughs> well, there you go. So it's the it's the meat between the ribs. Meat between <laughs> the ribs. A fish has intercostals like an animal would. So you've got these 
great lengths of flesh. Like, I mean, again, seems insignificant, but when you're working on a large volume with lots of fish, you've got all of these. So we use a metal skewer and then we thread this flesh on beautifully and uh, we grill it over charcoal and then serve it as a, a little appetizer at the start of the meal. Wouldn't it be an amazing thing if you could walk into a fish butchery and just say, I'll have a couple of chops, thanks, and I'll have a couple of fish sausages as well. Cool. So like, <laughs> so like meat <laughs> offal, I suppose, you know, it comes out in one piece. There shouldn't be the shock in seeing this, there should be the shock in seeing it go in the bin. From here now, we go along and we basically take things out one at a time. With the head, we, generally speaking, we steam this whole head and we pick all the meat from it and we make a head terrine. Take nice slices of it, we serve it with your pickles, chutneys, mustard, toast, bread. It's delicious. The other way is splitting it in half and grilling it on a charcoal grill. Get stuck into it, that's delicious. And then the eyes, I don't need to show you how to get the eye out, but basically it's just a matter of going around and then taking them out, so. Putting them in the blender. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> You've had praise from uh, Nigella Lawson, um, and I'm gonna have to quote it directly. Huh. Uh, Josh is a genius, and not straight from central casting, but the quiet genius, who is less concerned about his own brilliance and more absorbed in his subject. And then Jamie Oliver, Josh is mind blowing, and a very clever boy. How does that sit on you? Heavy. <laughs> Heavy, yeah. <laughs> no, it's... Um... You know, the, these two individuals, Jamie and Nigella, I grew up, you know, watching their shows and, you know, even meeting both of them again last year when I, when I travelled with the book, Jamie put on a party for me at his headquarters um, in North London. So tonight's really exciting because it's just a chef's night. There's this lovely, very humble, very talented young chef called Josh. He's, he's just got a different way of looking at things. My name was projected onto a wall saying, welcome to London, Josh. <laughs> and Jamie said, welcome, big hug, and you know, come on in and we're cooking you some dinner. And Jamie's explaining the dishes that he cooked that night. And he was saying, you know, I've made this pasta and it's gonna be with this sauce that we've made from all these herbs. And the way he was addressing the table with no film crew at all, was like I was on set of, you know, The Naked Chef when I was watching it as like a 10 year old boy at home. So it was unbelievably surreal to sit and just be engaged by people that you just feel just you would never have the opportunity to meet. So yeah, spoiled. What does the James Beard Award mean to you? Oh, another unattainable kind of success that's come out of the blue. Um, I mean, taking photos of fish offal and, um, <laughs> you know, publishing recipes about how to make an eyeball into a chip. Like, that's very brave for any publisher. And I feel like the group of people that I got to work with, in particular Rob Palmer, the photographer, who managed to capture all these moments on, on his lens, um, was they were all at the peak of their game. The John Dory that's in the book was the only one John Dory I'd seen in two months whilst preparing to get the book shot. So we had one opportunity to get it right. So uh, it was a remuneration to a group of people that really deserved it. It was amazing. And you couldn't go to New York to receive the award. And it, it's, <laughs> I, 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 it's been described to me as the Oscars for the food industry. Yeah. Um, how do you celebrate something like that? It was quiet fist pumps in the middle of the air <laughs> <laughs> in, in my bed uh, at three o'clock in the morning when some of my friends in LA were texting me saying, you've won. And I'm like, Oh, and like I'm still waking up. And then another friend sent through and he goes, you've won bloody two. <laughs> and I'm like, I wasn't up for two, I was up for one. And they go, you've won book of the year. And um, that was, uh, yeah, it was just, yeah, a couple of quiet fist pumps and trying not to wake my wife, Julia. Uh, first Australian to win? First Australian to win book of the year. <laughs> Where does the love of food come from? We spoke to your mum and she swears that she is the worst cook in the world. <laughs> uh, she says there wasn't any fish on the menu. 
Um, so you definitely didn't get it from her. No, and I, and I, you know, regrettedly in front of about 500 people as a young man speaking in front of an audience said that mum's cooking was a four out of 10. So <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I felt bad saying that later, but yeah, mm. she, I think like, and speaking about mum here, uh, when I was sick as a kid, I had, I had a tumour as an eight year old and I would go and have my chemotherapy twice a week, sometimes three. Uh, and she would drive me to Newcastle. I would get my chemo, whether it was a half an hour session or a three hour session, uh, would depend on then how sick I'd be afterwards. And then we'd wait around there for a little bit, then we'd drive home. Majority of the time, mum would make me lunch and usually that'd be a chicken pie or, you know, something nice. And like, it was almost like a warm hug, like with regards to some of the food that, you know, I'd have before going back to school. So there was a couple of hours each week or a few hours each week where it was just mum and I driving in the car back and forth and having a bit of lunch together and then her taking me back to school. So that was the routine. And from that, I think embedded in my brain slightly is this kind of, there's no greater human action than to cook somebody a meal and give them some kind of, you know, like it's such a generous thing to do for somebody to cook them a meal uh, with love and, you know, I just thought that was wonderful. And a lot of that was the way I like to cook. I like to watch people eat their food. I like being in an open kitchen. I like to, you know, be as generous as I can be um, to, to make sure I have people, people have a great time because uh, we're feeding people. Did you know what it was to have cancer or did you understand what it was when you were a young fella and you did receive that diagnosis? Yeah, it was <clears throat> on the 13th of October, it was my eighth birthday and uh, we had the token Macca's party that uh, I think every eight year old in Maitland had at that time. <laughs> so we had the ice cream cake and uh, you know, we did the limbo and we had a great time. And then the next day I came down like a sack of bricks and you know, we put it down to a burnt it at both ends kind of thing and too much sugar. And, uh, but then mum booked an appointment at the doctors for the next day on the 15th. And she, uh, yeah, we went in at eight o'clock and then by 5.30 in the evening after MRIs and CAT scans and x-rays, the doctor said to mum and I, your son's got a Wilms tumour, it's in stage two, it's fairly, there's a presence there, it's quite a big tumour. And we need to get you to hospital tonight so we can get your son there in an ambulance or you guys can get him there. And I said ambulance straight away because I thought that sounded pretty cool. <laughs> um, and then well, I remember getting in the car with mum and we were about halfway home. And all I thought of at the time was cancer's what old people get. And I just asked mum, would I die? And then when you see your mum cry, that's when it all becomes very real. And so that was hard. That was our life then for the next 18 months, two years. And what it you, was intense. What do you think the effect was on the whole family from that period? <laughs> uh, I, yeah, it was, I now having three children, um, one that's nearly seven. Uh, I, I have no idea how my mum and dad did what they did. The composure and the way that they adapted to the whole situation was just mind blowing. And I only realise that now. Um, the way, like my dad had, a, had his own business at home and he, the way that he was able to just stay at home, keep the wheels turning, keep money coming in, getting my sister to school and then mum literally sleeping on a chair next to me mm -hmm. in Sydney in a hospital room because I didn't want her to go stay in, you know, another part of the hospital or somewhere more comfortable. She had to be right there. So, yeah, just the resilience of all of them, even my sister as well, when all the attention is on the younger sibling for her to show huge amounts of maturity at 10 years old. Um, yeah, amazing. Most kids growing up in Maitland, they have a poster of a Newcastle knight on the wall. Uh, Who did you have posted on your wall? Yeah, although Robbie O. Davis was on one corner. Oh, really? <laughs> no, we, yeah, there was a few of Joey and, you know, uh, Darren Albert scoring the try in 97 and all that. But um, the, you know, Shannon Bennett was on there from Vue and and uh, Warren Turnbull from Assiette was on there as well. And, you know, Neil Perry, there was just, 
a wall of chefs um, that, that I kind of idolised and, and their dishes. And I don't know, it was just this fascination. Like I, I'd pick up Gourmet Travellers, I'd pick up Vogue magazines, I'd look through all of these different uh, food cookbooks and even watch Huey and Jeff Jantz and Jamie and Nigella and all these people doing their shows and I'd just be, you know, I think it was the coolest thing ever. Um, and then to decide to go and be a chef, that was just the coolest thing ever, especially when I got to put on my first set of chef whites. Yeah. You, uh, you were working in cafes by the time you were 14, but your, uh, your wife also tells us about a, a box of exercise books filled with potential recipes. <laughs> yeah. When I first started in cafes and, and restaurants, I would fill them from front to back and they'd be full of diagrams and paragraphs written out of a book that I'd read. And, you know, I think I've got every single French culinary term known to man written out throughout these books. And, and I'm so glad that I did because by writing something, I seem to retain it. Um, and that kind of basin of knowledge and even what my chefs were telling me through the day, I would take the rest of the night once I got home to write down that I shouldn't have done that or this was the better way and this was why. And so there was a plan, like there was a very strong desire to try to achieve as much as I could and to be as focused as I could and also make sure that the work that was being put into me was actually going to be fulfilled into something and not just, you know, an empty kind of useless information going in one ear out the other. So I was trying to retain as much as I could. What advice do you give someone who's stepping into the industry at the bottom? Uh, for me, <clears throat> don't get caught up in the allure of the end product. Like there's phenomenal restaurants in Sydney and there's phenomenal restaurants around the world and throughout Australia. And there is that aspiration as a young cook to get yourself into the very best kitchen that you can straight away. Um, and that's a great thing to have, but I feel sometimes stones are skipped over uh, if, you're, if you're wanting that straight away. And if you go into a really elite kitchen, there is an assumed base knowledge that's required for that kind of cooking. So to go into a neighbourhood restaurant that you may have eaten at as a kid, or you know, your mum and dad might have taken you to, and you may have been introduced to the chef already, start, start smaller and learn the process like make a mayonnaise, bake some bread, learn how to fill it a fish. Um, and then going to the next stage, then there'll be some base knowledge there. Um, without a basin of knowledge and technique, then it's very hard to evolve on that and very hard to push forward. Yeah. So it's baby steps, like start small and then grow, which I need to tell myself that, you know, 15, 16 years ago, I should have said that to myself because yeah. I wanted it all right now. How did you make Julie? <laughs> Julie and I met on Bastille Day, uh, July 14, um, 12 years ago. And her and I were in a cooking competition at Ultimo TAFE College. I'd set up as the fourth year and she was on another bench of the first year and she came over to my bench and said, oh, like, you know, are you a first year? And like, she kind of eyeballed what I was doing and things. And she said to me later that she was just checking out the competition just to make <laughs> sure that I wasn't a first year and I wasn't up against her. I said, no, no, I'm a fourth year. And she said, oh, okay. And then from there, it was a bit of back and forth chatting and what are you cooking and, you know. Uh, and then, you know, she won the competition as a first year and I won as a fourth year. And then she said, oh, I've got to go and change, blah, blah, blah. I said, oh, I'll sit with your bag. So I sat with her knife kit while she went off and got changed at the end of the day. And then when she came out, I asked her if she wanted to have dinner with me and it was love at first sight. And um, yeah, we're, we're really great friends. And I think that's the, the real crux of it. She's my best friend and we've had so much fun. And St. Peter's, the kind of our dream restaurant that we traveled together and we worked at the Fat Duck and we saw Paris and we saw Spain just after getting married. And, um, well, it was the, the honeymoon at the Fat Duck. Yeah, the working honeymoon, <laughs> <laughs> which is a good one. To, yeah, I think everybody should um, <laughs> invest in So it really was, it really, during your honeymoon? Legitimately you... a working honeymoon. So we got married um, and two days later we set off for London and we got off one week, we, um, <laughs> one week of eating and then it was straight to, the, uh, straight to Bray where we worked really, really hard. <laughs> 
Why open up St Peter? For me, opening St Peter was really... To me, it was filling a bit of a void in Sydney where it was a tricky one to find, just a, a, a good place to, to have a bit of fish. Um, and that was really, that was really it. I, I'd been taught by Stephen Hodges at Fish Face, and I don't even know if he would remember this. And he said to me, because uh, I was asking him, we've got all this mackerel coming in, we've got bonito coming in, you know, I'm trying to think of dishes to put up on the blackboard at Fish Face and, you know, I'm like, how do you, how do you think of, you know, different garnishes for all these different species? Because we're trying to showcase what the fish tastes like. We shouldn't have a garnish that over the top of it and covers it. And so, you know, can you give me a, any tips? And he said to me, <laughs> he just goes, just think of it as a bloody bit of meat, you know, like a, you know, think of a mackerel like a pigeon or think of tuna like a bit of cow and think of, you know, and he just rattled off all these analogies of meat and fish. And like I said, I don't think Steve actually remembers telling me that, but that was something that I kind of just buried and wrote down in my book. And, and then when I came back to it later when we had St. Peter and the thoughts around, is it possible to dry age a fish? And is it possible to think of fish as meat? And then you go back to the kind of those scrappy drawings in books and things like that and think, oh, well, Steve told me that tuna you could pretty much pitch as a cow. And if you can put that kind of garnish with a bit like beef fillet, then why can't I do it with a tuna fillet? And then it really starts getting very expansive very quickly. How much of a fish is normally used? Around 45 to 50%, so about half. 45%, yeah. And you're utilising basically all of the fish in here, including eyeballs, stomach, scales, you're using a lot. Yes, and <laughs> yes. And everything else? Yeah. What was the drive to do that? Uh, fear of the business closing. Honestly, it was having signed a lease that had my name on it as the director, that was the inspiration behind how can I keep this business open? How can I give everybody premium fish when they walk in the door? And how can I have a menu that's protein heavy? That's, you know, there's no gesture of a vegetarian option or there's no, you know, ricotta cheese, like, you know, there's no little winning dish. Like everything's a, either a crab or a prawn or a fish. Uh, everything's served very generously. Um, so you're looking at a food cost if you did the maths on it, it'd be like 40 to 45% if you were, you know, taking the center cuts out of a piece of coral trout and, you know, throwing the rest in the bin. And you're selling every part of it. How do you, how do you talk to somebody who might be a little bit grossed out about eating the eyeballs of a fish? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oftentimes you don't tell them what it is they're eating first and then let them eat it and say, wow, that's delicious. What is that? And it's the eyeball. Um, but the work of a chef basically is to bring desirability to f food and like, you know, not only desirability, but to cook things correctly and, and serve them in a beautiful way that encourages people to return to your business and, and you know, have a great time. Ultimately, St. Peter is there because I want to cook somebody's dinner. Like, I really have a deep and like desire to want to cook your fish for your dinner and for you to talk about that down the line and say, remember that time when we had a great meal at St. Peter? Remember that time when we used, Dad used to take me to fish butchery and have fish and chips? Like those kinds of nostalgic memories that may not happen for another 10 or 15 years to the young four or five year olds coming in now for their fish and chips, that's, you know, knowing that is, that's exciting for me. But um, yeah. I read, your, I read your book and I noticed at the back you've got desserts like fish, uh, fish fat chocolate caramel slice. <laughs> How do you come up with something like that? <laughs> if, if I know that, you know, this is all like puzzle pieces. When you look at a fish, it's almost like a bit of a matrix. If I know that, you know, if the throat comes out, I can do this with it. If the roe comes out, I can do that with it. If I know that I can make a pate out of the liver, then that's one in, under the belt, you know what I mean? So mm. you start growing this repertoire within one product. And when the repertoire grows and you've got all these things that you can produce with, then it's then about just pulling down on them. So if I know I can make a puree out of carrots, but also I know that I can roast it, you know, 
that there's multi layers to each ingredient. So one of those ingredients that comes out of a fish is fat. So if you have fat, then butter is a fat. So why can't I make a butter caramel, but substitute butter for fish fat? Um, and then other people would say, well, why would you? Uh, but to cook something and taste it and find it delicious and intriguing and fascinating and means us not having to buy a $300 cube of butter in a week and then we can use fish fat that we've already paid $300 for the fish, then that makes sense as a business model. Um, it just doesn't make sense to throw half a fish in the bin. No. You're an incredibly accomplished guy of 31. You've made it to the top of your field. Mm. Uh, what drives you to excel? I love my work. I, I really love the process of my work and I love working with the t team of people that I've got here. I'm going to really look forward to teaching, like mentoring and trying to encourage and inspire the next generation of young Australian chefs because I think that's the biggest thing. It's just trying to make an impact on the on the profession that I'm in so that it inspires people, not only to eat in our restaurant, but just to improve the quality of what we're working on, to, to try to make a difference that goes beyond just being in a restaurant making nice food. I'm trying to improve the standard of fish so that, you know, like we said, we're not throwing half a fish in the bin. I mean, if we can take 90% yield from a fish, that means that's two fish of like of, of what was previously considered normal. If we're only taking 45% and throwing the other half in the bin, then that's another fish out of the water. Um, I know I'm talking on a very small scale here, and I know that fish eye chips aren't for everyone, uh, but to prove that you can do something with it, like that spurs me on to want to look for what else, you know, I can do. So there is a pursuit of what next, like what, and this kind of self-motivated kind of thing. And I feel like maybe being sick as a kid has really made me very focused on wanting to achieve as much as I can, um, you know, because it can all have, you can all have it all taken away very quickly. And Josh, you've reached the top of your field. Uh, you've changed the way that we consume and relate to fish. I can't wait to see what comes next. So thanks for joining me on One Plus One. Thanks, Ta.